psychology from the APA convention. I'm the host for this session, uh, Russell Schilling. I'm the chief scientific officer for APA. And I'll let my uh, two guests introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Caitlin Roos. I am a fourth year PhD student at Michigan Technological University, uh, studying higher level cognition in games. My name is Sean Doherty. I'm an associate professor at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in the Human Factors and Behavioral Neuroscience Department. I am also currently the program chair for Division 21 here at APA, which is the Applied Experimental and Engineering Psychology Division. I'll leave it there. Okay. And today what we're going to be discussing is the psychology of eSports, why it's relevant to psychology and why we should care as psychologists about eSports. And so I'll start out with just asking that question of our panelists. So why, why should psychologists be uh, concerned with eSports? Psychologists should be concerned with esports for many reasons, regardless of what discipline you're a part of. Uh, we have many people of many disciplines here uh, at APA, and so whether it's the mental part, so um, disorders, abnormal psychology, stress management, performance psychology, coming from sports psychology, um, development of a culture, communication, team dynamics. Uh, there are many facets of esports that I think are fascinating, if not maybe confusing to a lot of psychologists, and it hasn't really been delved into very much. So I think it's an open field that I'm calling upon many psychologists to explore further. Okay. Well, it's so open, in fact, because it's relatively brand new. So just to give a little bit of context, um, esports involves the use of uh, video games. Um, in competition with other video game players. So just as in traditional sports you may have one team um, competing against another one, it's the same thing for eSports but we're utilizing video games where you have one team competing against another within a video game context. So that's what we're talking about here with eSports and so this is a relatively new area for research in that Esports is relatively new as a discipline itself, which means that there's not a lot of research on it, which provides a lot of opportunity. Okay. Well, I know all three of us have been active in games. So my, in my background, I've uh, uh, helped uh, create games. I was a sound designer on a major title. Uh, I funded uh, at various times various educational and games for impact. So uh, really been part of the, uh, uh, the culture. Uh, a big fan of Portal. Uh, my favorite yes. video game. We have to get that out there. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, what are the what are the differences you see between traditional gaming uh, in those contexts and esports? You 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 hit on a few of them just now, uh, but what what do you, how do you see the overall differences? I think a lot of times there's a lot of um, environmental pressure coming on the side of the professionals as they are literally being paid on a stage to perform well, and they are expected to perform well. They're expected to face their fans, the media, um, with a certain professional face. Um, they're expected to be professional, they're expected to perform both internally within the team um, and maybe externally if they attend events and things. So I think that in and of itself, those pressures um, that have given a lot of young players, because the average age of esports players has actually is slowly rising, and I say very slowly. Um, I think it is now 24 years old. Uh, so typically, um, esports players are between 18 and 28. Um, yes, there are people outside of that range, um, but players typically are very young. So these pressures of maybe things that people in other careers would experience on a day-to-day -day basis, maybe that are more mature in development, um, they're experiencing this in a very high pressure situation. Uh, so this may be very new to them and very difficult um, compared to maybe more casual players. And I say casual in quotes, um, <laughs> maybe non-professionals, but there are definitely competitive players and maybe more casual players, um, but they're not quite at the level of the esports professionals. Yeah. So I, I certainly agree that ha there are different levels of play. And so you may have different uh, 
views or different pressures at those different levels. But if we're talking about professional players, you're talking about just like sports teams, they may be playing in front of hundreds of thousands of spectators. Their performance may be streamed to people watching online. Um, and so th their performance is under scrutiny all the time, um, just like standard sports teams typically are. And so there's a lot of pressures. And so while Russ, you and I may have grown up on largely solo play games yep. because we didn't, you know, back in our day, we didn't have multiplayer. No. Uh, <laughs> nowadays, there is much more integration of coordination between people and in teams and play through esports. And so I think that's a, a big difference that has been growing over time. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of our, our listeners to this uh, will um, be familiar with some of the news items out for the professional leagues. Uh, what, what are we seeing in the schools? I mean, so what is the overall, I know you've helped create a, a league, uh, so what does, what's that like on the non-professional levels? What are we seeing out there for this? Um, I know a lot of universities have reported um, university benefits to uh, integrating an esports program. Uh, for example, increase in recruitment, uh, increase in uh, enrollment, obviously, um, and in a general increase, I believe, in student well-being and happiness across campus, um, especially across maybe individuals um, who are international students. Um, my university has many international students, um, and in my survey that I sent out, and actually eSport Climate Survey, um, many students that were international students felt it would be an excellent opportunity to integrate this program into our university because eSports is such a, um, a worldwide thing. It is such an international thing. It brings people of different countries together, different backgrounds. Um, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, you may identify as a gamer or a part of this fan base or a part of this team. So um, I think just like, you know, we talk about the Olympics being that thing that kind of brings the world together, you know, obviously in competition, but, um, you know, to, to join ourselves. And that's kind of what esports does. So from a university perspective, in my opinion, it's very attractive for um, a student to feel that they can find a place that they can belong and identify with. You know, you may feel maybe you're not the greatest football player, maybe you're not a traditional athlete, and this is your thing, you game. Like, this is what you're good at and this is what you identify with. And it allows you to represent your university in a way um, that you can be proud of and you can represent in a unique way compared to traditional sports. Yeah. Absolutely. And you touched on one piece in there, which is that it provides a different avenue or culture for support for students as well. So as just as we have at most universities, there are many clubs for all sorts of different kinds of interests. This is another avenue for providing a culture, a way for students to engage uh, with one another, but it goes that one step further in the sense that now there is also a clear purpose uh, that is gaining for these students as part of that activity. So. Yeah. Well, and one of the other things that I've seen, uh, and I have, I've had some discussions with some of the uh, folks in, uh, involved in esports, is kind of the controversy that I think that's out there between uh, gender-based uh, 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 leagues versus non-gender-based. Uh, uh, and I think the argument, which I kind of fall on the side of, is that this is we have a level playing field in this this area, and we should actually treat it as a level playing field, and not really start with that uh, gender uh, discrimination kind of uh, issues in in sports. Do you have any, any no, thoughts? No, absolutely. I mean, being a female in gaming, identifying as a female uh, in the gaming community, um, it is not easy, um, and I'm sure many people of many different backgrounds and identities uh, feel similarly. Um, however, I will say, gaming has come a long way. Um, people realize at the end of the day, you know, they want to win. You want to win that SR, you want to win that rank, you want to be the best. And it really doesn't matter who you have on your team at the end of the day as long as you win. Um, and so I think that that's what we're striving for, um, especially in the professional scene. I know they are looking at trying to increase diversity. Um, and similar to the problems that women face in STEM and other um, oppressed groups or minority groups in STEM where they're kind of push down a little bit or they, they grow up feeling hesitant in engaging in these environments. And so I think that opening up the community and having such a diverse and welcoming community that I know the esports leagues are striving to do um, by decreasing toxicity and things like that and celebrating um, diversity, 
Um, so I think that that's where we're going, and I think it's it's coming along, and we're going to get there. Uh, we're not there now, um, but in my experience, being the female president and the only uh, identified female in my esports organization um, and the co-founder, um, you know, I've had a little bit of difficulties, but um, I do my best as a face of an organization to try to get people and say, hey, we're welcoming, we want you right. in. It doesn't matter where you come from. If you love gaming and you love to compete, we want you to be a part of this. And so at that point, it'll start growing once people feel that they can identify with that group. Very good. Well, and the interesting thing is that it's not just esports. That is, if you take a look at the proportion of people that play games in general, it's a basically a 50-50 split and right. has been for at least um, a that I'm aware of for the last 10 years that right. people have been collecting data on that information. And so it's not just esports, it's gaming overall has become much more balanced in terms of the people that are playing it. Okay. Well, well let's get down to the psychology uh, part <laughs> Absolutely. Now. So we, we, we've, we've done our setup discussing a little <laughs> bit about esports and the culture. Um, you know, we, we, we've, especially uh, lately in the news, we've been hearing a lot of the negatives that people perceive about games, and we'll get to those in a little bit. But let's talk a little bit about what you see as the positives in games that we know from psychological theory and from data, and where you see the research uh, uh, gaps in this area. Because I know right now, being as new as it is, there's really not a lot of specific research in this area. So, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Okay. Sort of so. Again, I'm program chair for Division 21. 21 looks at um, scientific research to try and understand how people interact with technology, of which this certainly is a key element of that. And so, uh, if we want to talk about benefits, there's a really important paper that came out in 2014 in American Psychologist uh, by Granick LaBelle and uh, Engels um, that outlines a very long list of benefits that come from playing video games. Uh, from cognitive effects and emotional effects and social effects. So for example, uh, one of the things that they outline is that um, playing video games oftentimes improves spatial awareness, understanding where things are in three-dimensional space, uh, which is required for a lot of different gameplay, especially for things like uh, first-person shooters, knowing where you are relative to your opponent and where you need to shoot in order to take them out um, generates an, an increase in awareness of you and your surroundings and the relative nature of where things are relative to one another. And part of the reason why this is so important is because there's also been evidence in the literature that demonstrates this increase in spatial awareness is also very highly correlated with success in uh, STEM areas. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so exactly. it's, video games can help improve these kinds of cognitive elements. Um, and there's many more things in there, but yeah. I'll provide well, let, for let, let me just uh, do yeah, a follow up absolutely. for you. Mm -hmm. Not all of the esports games are first person shooters, though. No, it's, it's well to, to mention. Right. So. And so, you know, there's certainly, I, I was just drawing that up because that's one that has been derived specifically or tied specifically to first person shooters. Right. But yes, there are many other genres as well that provide other, um, other benefits from games as well. Yeah, um, he pointed out a lot of the research that I've read, uh, which I think is both excellent and also um, needs needs improvement. Um, great work by Green and Bevier um, on a lot of attentional, spatial awareness, um, peripheral vision. Uh, spoiler alert, gamers are better than non-gamers at these things, but non-gamers can be trained to become just as good as gamers right. um, through hours of gameplay. Um, so for me, as a decision-making researcher, I'm thinking to myself, okay, but these players are making decisions on less than seconds, sometimes bases, time, time pressure wise. So I, I'm interested in that aspect, which that aspect has not been delved into a lot. So my research focused on trying to understand problem solving uh, in games and how video games can affect problem solving skills. And now currently the study is creativity as well. And so what, what we're finding is that um, non-gamers um, actually are able to benefit very greatly from playing just 30 minutes of Roller Coaster Tycoon, which those of you in the audience who are uh, maybe less than 30, I'm oh, not quite I see, sure. I see thumbs up from the audience. 
Um, we loved this game. I'm sure we all played hundreds of hours to our parents' dismay, uh, but we may have been increasing our uh, project management problem-solving skills. And so, again, in my discipline, we talk about well-defined and ill-defined problems. Well-defined problems are these things that maybe only have one correct solution, or it's a very obvious solution. Right. For example, a math problem. There's maybe one or two ways to do it. Uh, that our math teachers are trying to teach us, and, th and that's, that's how we and solve there, the and problem. there's only one right answer. Exactly. Correct. Um, yeah. But there, in the real world, I'm sure many of us experience ill-defined problems, which are problems that can be approached from many different directions, have many different solutions, and you can still come out with a good um, a solution or product or outcome. Mm -hmm. And so in games, a lot of times, players are presented with these ill-defined problems. You know, oh, this player is acting this way, or this situation is this way. I have this much money, I have this much territory, I have this many resources. I can do this multiple ways. So what I'm interested in is, what are those different ways, what are they considering, and why they're considering those things, and how that impacts something real world like solving a problem or coming up with creative solutions. And so I think that that area specifically of cognition, cognition is I think a very uh, buzzword because a lot of people have a different understanding of or opinion about what cognition is, but I would argue that this higher level cognition is what's missing from games research and especially valuable with esports because these are the experts that are doing these things. Right. Um, and um, as Sean mentioned, the social aspect as well. Um, I think there's a paper in there that's referenced in the in the Granick paper where they say people feel that their online friendships are more valuable and meaningful and fruitful than their in-person friendships. Uh, whether that's bonding over a hobby or communicating in a different sort of way or getting through these hard problems together. Um, so that I found was especially interesting coming out of that paper. But yeah, that's an excellent paper to look at. Um, parents or people that want to know about what are, the, what are the benefits of gaming, that's a great paper to start with. Yes. So, so what about the social aspects? So again, the, the, uh, uh, the um, popular concept, concept of a gamer is somebody who's by themselves in their bedroom uh, with the lights out and, and in their gaming all night long. But that's not eSports, correct? No, <laughs> not at all, actually. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, yeah, you're sitting at a computer, but usually you have your team sitting right next to you, uh, kind of doing the same thing. Um, but you're almost having a conversation, not face to face. So if we were all on a team and I said, okay, there's a flank coming from the right, you both would hear it and you both could respond and communicate back. Uh, obviously, we're, it's not like a conversation we're having right now, um, but it's a level of communication that now businesses are doing telecommunication. Um, maybe you can't afford to send your uh, sales guy to China but you can have a Skype call, and that, that concept of virtual communication is very similar. Right. And part of what you were alluding to, too, is that we're talking about professional esports, where they may be in the same physical location, right. just not necessarily oriented toward each other right. because they're talking through their headsets. But for things like casual esports, you're still working on a team with players that may be from around the world. So it's not only communication and coordination of people for that particular purpose, but oftentimes uh, players will, outside of the game themselves, coordinate with one another and talk to one another about things that are going on in their life or sharing other elements, right. which then increases things like cultural awareness. Um, if you're talking to somebody that is from around the world, um, they may have a very different perspective than you are, and that's something that esports can facilitate. Okay. So I have another question. So I, again, I see this as a, a very potentially broad area of research. So coming from, as you know, uh, my background uh, originally as a military experimental psychologist, uh, I'm familiar with the you know team training uh, research. So uh, uh, and, and decision making under stress and a lot of these other research areas, uh, some of which involve simulation, not necessarily games. Mm -hmm. So are we drawing on any of those concepts from these bigger other areas into our research uh, uh, thinking on these? Absolutely, I know um, a lot of education research that's being done um, trying to understand learning, and ga learning using games, serious games, um, or games for learning. There are many different terms for that. Um, that are being used, but I know that especially in areas like military, aviation's been using simulations since they were probably first made. I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure about the history of simulations, but, but the point is it's a, it's a form of a game. I would argue a simulation to some degree 
a visual simulation can be maybe considered a game if there are objectives, um, if there are uh, potentially multiple decision points, um, if there are other players involved. Um, and so that, that makes the question like what is considered a game? And so obviously that's a little distant from esports, yeah. um, but when you get in the concept of training and learning, um, and potentially team building or leadership development that I know is um, you know, very important in, in a military context. Um, those concepts are happening. They're doing that training um, for these players because it needs to happen. You need to maybe have that individual that is the commander or the shot caller is, is a typical term for it, that makes the decisions. They get the information and they make the decisions. They, they, they make the calls. And so that, that is a skill, arguably, that needs to be developed or worked on depending on the dynamic of your team. Yeah. And there's certainly, when you talk about esports, the skills that esports players have comes from a wide array of different topic areas that can be drawn upon uh, from pre-existing literature. So things like expertise has right. been looked at for decades. And so we can draw upon that kind of literature to try and understand how somebody might become an esports player expert. The interesting thing, though, is that, of course, Katie made the argument of games may not exactly be the same as simulation, but they're very similar. But then we also have to consider, well, what is different about video games? And we have this body of literature that already exists, but you may have now with video games something that nobody's really looked at in that way before. Right. Um, and so there are some elements of just basic perceptual processes that we know a lot about that can apply to video games. How fast can somebody respond? How quickly can somebody see something? Um, but there are ways in which we are looking at games that, and ways in which games are played that haven't really been addressed before that is a wide open area for research. Okay. Well, let's get down in the weeds. I'll ask you a hard one now. So we'll, we'll, we'll pull, pull, uh, pull out the hard uh, questions. So I've been doing technology research almost all of my career. And one of my big concerns uh, in simulation and games is that we, we do our research on these games or on simulations, but they're very game and simulation specific. So what's the generalizability uh, 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 with some of our research? Because again, the games that we put, when I was doing work on uh, 20 years ago are certainly not like the games that are out there today, uh, and which will not be like the games that are going to be out in another even five years. So what can we say across time? What, what generalizes on these, uh, on these issues? And what doesn't, really? So going back to the, the literature, we're talking, for example, about training literature. Right, there's a, a very large uh, body of knowledge about what trains and what doesn't and okay. generalizability and specificity of skills. Um, and so it depends a little bit on what kind of skills you're talking about as to the degree of uh, generalizability. And so, for example, if you learn how to play tennis um, and then you start taking up badminton, well, some of the basic hand-eye coordination skills might apply, but a lot of the specifics for that game may not generalize very well, right? So a shot that you play in badminton is certainly not gonna be exactly the same one as it is in tennis. Right. And so a lot of the skills that we learn in playing games um, some of the basic hand-eye coordination elements may transfer, but a lot of the cognition, there's, the, the literature's a bit mixed on that as to exactly how much and how well it, these kinds of skills transfer. Okay. Hmm. No, I would agree with that. I think the T word transfer is a big problem. <laughs> yes. uh, um, the problem solving research is one, is our lab's attempt to answer that question specifically for problem solving and creativity, the effects of games on, on those two abilities. And whether or not they could transfer to a quote, real world situation or a real problem. For example, we use the, the Dunker problem. So they're analogical problems on the surface. They're very different. There's a medical example, and then there's a military example. The solution's the exa exactly the same. It's a divide and conquer. So you're either dividing the rays up to attack the tumor, which gives you the same intensity, but from obviously a combined angle, or you divide your troops among all of the little roads so your men don't blow up on the mines. The, the answer's the same, but people get caught up on the surface features. And so I think that 
how people are able to come at those problems and able to see past those surface features, whether that's I'm in a simulation and this is what I'm being trained on, I don't see the real world transfer here and they have that difficulty, but there are people that are pushing past that and are able to see past that and say, this is what I've learned, whether it's a mental model, whether it's a different approach to problem solving, whether it's I need to consider this resource, I need to think about this resource differently. Um, games provide that constant change of pace. Things are different, not all features are the same. You can control for that, which makes it sometimes a really great tool for research. Uh, we all love control, uh, which is great, um, but also it allows you to see how people are able to navigate the environment and really take what they've learned and transfer it over. But I think where we're lacking is how do we measure that transfer? Um, you know, how do you quantify, oh, you know, this is a transfer of decision making or this is this. So my other research is focused on identifying those key cues and facets of decision making at critical points within a game and categorizing those. And I actually pulled a categorization scheme from the military, strategic, operational, and tactical decisions. And so I found those in both football players and in Overwatch players and in League of Legends players. So these types of decisions are happening in different contexts, but the key is to note, for example, for transfer maybe is, what do all of those have in common? Or what are the trends and strategies of what they're using right. with these different types of decisions um, to solve these types of problems? Okay. And so, but again, you know, I, I think decision making is a great skill. I think it applies in different uh, things. There are many different facets of it, different pressures. Um, and that also includes the perceptual motor stuff. Right. You know, maybe, maybe you're tired or maybe you're realizing you, there's an issue with a technology or yourself and you're like, I have to deal with this, this issue and this is going to affect my decision making. So there's a lot th of things that affect it. So um, I think for uh, my opinion is that decision making and other similar um, aspects of psychology would be great to attack that transfer problem. Okay. All right, another question then. Uh, uh, actually, Bring it on. <laughs> yeah, so, well, actually, this should be uh, maybe easier. So, again, I've had two, uh, another couple roles in my, my background. So, I, I co chaired a, uh, uh, a White House uh, committee on digital gaming for a while, uh, and I was at the Department of Education. But during those times, I was looking at educational games. Uh, and one of the things one of my PIs did, a, a non psychologist, I might add, but still a good guy. Uh, Zoran, <laughs> Zoran Popovic uh, at University of Washington, who also did the Folded game, so a problem-solving yes. game. Mm -hmm. uh, he was doing work for me on doing uh, educational games in algebra and physics and some mm -hmm. other areas, and also being funded by the Gates Foundation for this. Uh, one of the things he did, which was really interesting, is uh, he took an adapted version of Dragon Box that used some of his technology. And if you don't know Dragon Box, Dragon Box is a game that purports, you can argue about this uh, question, to teach algebra in two hours. But it's a brilliant game, it's very engaging. Uh, but what he did is he took the game out and he did a uh, statewide competition for the uh, entire state of Washington. And then he, after that, he went out for another state and then he did the uh, country of Norway. So, and including the prime minister of Norway who was playing this game, so oh learning algebra. So, I mean, do you see these types of things maybe being things we should be focusing on as well down the road for, or, or, or am I out of uh, my mind and, and it's totally out of, uh, I think a lot of uh, people, um, and I mentioned this in, in the panel yesterday, um, a lot of uh, people like consumers or educators, they want that magic pill. They want that solution to end all be all. And games has a lot of promise. Um, the drawback of that is that games take a lot of time. Games take a lot of money. Games take a lot of resources to do it right. Yes. And so if you don't have a, a team or the resources, maybe you can't do that. And right. so, for example, in my research, I'm looking at an off the shelf $5 on Steam game. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, but some uh, of those are good. No, no, exactly. And so, you know, if we're getting, obviously it's not meant to teach algebra, something yeah. like that, but there are games, I think it's called TI something, but it's supposed to teach the basics of programming. TI right. 100. Yes. There you go. Thank you. Uh, you can tell uh, how much I've played that game in my Steam library. Yeah. Um, but, but games like that that are more specified but are definitely on the surface, you can tell it's more of a game. Um, I think hiding that instead of just having it be, this is an educational game because 
people may approach that very differently than they would a more off the shelf game. Right. And so, but no, I don't think that, I think games for learning and serious games, I think they're great. Uh, a lot of medical simulations are very, or get medical games are simula and simula incorporate simulations. Um, they're great. I mean, they're useful. They've demonstrated progress over time in teaching a certain skill, maybe in oh, two weeks to a, to a new surgeon or whatever it is. Um, and they've shown great success. So I think if you have the research backing and you're yeah. demonstrating that um, whatever field it is or whatever task it is, you're demonstrating learning gains, yeah. nothing well, wrong with it. And what was interesting about Dragon Box too, is, uh, for, at least in the research, and this was an adapted version, so it was an off the, not the off the shelf version, mm. but uh, they were actually showing some kindergarten, or, uh, kindergarten kids solving uh, the, uh, the, the oh, challenges. Wow. Uh, in the game. Slower, obviously, than the older kids, but still amazing that you could actually yeah. teach some at least basic algebra concepts uh, to kids wow. that young. So, uh, really a lot you can do with games. So. A absolutely. The one caveat, though, is we have to be careful in how they are designed. Yes. Because certainly there's been a, a lot of research over the years that has demonstrated that if it's not designed in the right way, then whoever is utilizing these educational games may not actually be learning anything. Right. And they may not be motivated. Because that's one of the important elements of games, is that uh, in playing a game, there's a, there's a lot of motivation from the person playing the game because it's fun, it's enjoyable. And yeah. so if they're having a lot of fun and they're actually learning something along with the fun, then there's that added benefit. And so um, there has to be a careful consideration in terms of the design of that education to make sure that there is the fun driving the motivation and the education comes along with it as opposed to the education with just a little bit of fun in which case then a lot of people say you're trying to teach me something aren't you and they aren't going to follow through with right. it necessarily and so uh, video games have a, a very big um, benefit in terms of motivation right. in terms of continuing on and, yeah. and I'll give you one example of this there's a statistic that um, was given a, a number of years ago by a researcher by the name of Jane McGonigal who argued that children in this day and age are spending just as much time, if not more time, playing video games than they actually spend in school. So then the question becomes, well, what are they actually learning from exactly. all of this gameplay? Yeah. Um, and so there is potential a lot, potentially a lot of power in terms of uh, the possibility for games. And yeah. adding to that, to the McGonagall argument, they're already doing it. Right. Why, why would you not leverage it? Right. Uh, you know, to some degree, leverage it in a positive way that they can relate to and are motivated by to succeed. And another good example is the psychology of failure. You know. Nobody likes to fail, it doesn't feel good. Um, but an example is the Dark Souls series is notorious for being one of the hardest game series. It is punishing, you know, you see this, the text, you died every time you died, so you get that reminder every single time, and it sucks. But victory is like a little bit out of your reach. So once you're able to solve that problem ahead of you, you feel good and you're like, I wanna keep going. You know, you might die 50 more times, but you're mo it continuously motivates you to continue to solve those problems. And so similar in a learning game, you know, obviously maybe a little less harsh, you don't need a you failed, you know, <laughs> maybe necessarily up there, but if you're able to kind of get them right above their capability right. level, and they can be so confident once they solve it, and they can just want to do more. They're, you know, I solve this, I can do this, I want to learn more. That is what, um, yeah, that's incorporating that into design. Well, and having funded quite a few games, one of the big problems, which actually we could use, this, this is a research area in itself for psychology. It's almost impossible to create an engaging game that, uh, if you're doing it for education, that is engaging for a wide variety of students. So, I mean, there, there's, it's very much preferential. So, again, how do you uh, develop a game that, that goes across, you know, cultural divides and gender divides? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have two kids with autism, so you look at neurotypical kids. I mean, so the gameplay, the game dynamics, and the themes, I mean, it's, the, when you look at a game, what most people don't realize, even in the research, is that these are actually a very complex cultural uh, 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 entities in themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's like studying a, a complex, any other complex environment in psychology. I'll tell one story since we're talking education and then we'll move on. Uh, I was on the America's Army video game development team back in, uh, this was around 2001, using a cutting edge first person shooter uh, uh, video game engine. 
uh, I was very excited. They wanted to do medic training. So I was a medical service corps officer. I said, this is going to be great. We're going to have fully interactive. We're going to have them down in there, and you're going to be able to uh, treat wounds, and it's going to be wonderful. Uh, the Army said, we want it next week. So what we end up having to do, and this is the worst use of a game <laughs> platform ever, is we created a classroom, and we had the players had to come into the classroom, sit down in a chair, and watch PowerPoint <laughs> slides of an instructor uh, as, as they were giving lectures, and then pass a test. It was so painful and embarrassing. But what came out of that, we were starting, and again, this is another area of, of how powerful these can be. We, uh, uh, about two months after we released it, we got a letter uh, on an email from uh, this kid that said, I saved my brother's life because I had gone through your training program and we were in an accident and he was bleeding and I was able to uh, uh, stop the bleeding. So, I mean, even in these cases, you know, and it, it, was, it was kind of an, a wake-up call for me to see that, you know, how much the, you know, one, that you could actually get players to go in for a half an hour, an hour, and sit in a virtual classroom and watch. And I was one of the instructors, by the way. Um, <laughs> So it was my voice uh, droning on at them, but it, very uh, lifelike to the Army and uh, Navy experience. Uh, but they will do that. So, you know, it, these are very interesting things. So <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> so let's, okay, so uh, we, we've talked for a while. Uh, there's usually an elephant in the room about gaming, uh, and especially in these times when we have uh, mass violence uh, situations. Uh, and I know some of our uh, listeners are probably asking themselves. So. You know, what are your views? Um, we know that in 2015, uh, uh, the APA released a statement on video games talking about aggression. Uh, we're currently reviewing uh, newer literature, so we'll be uh, discussing that at a later date, what, what we come out from that. Um, but, uh, you know, I've been answering questions here this past week uh, on the differences between violence and aggression, uh, which is a psychological set of constructs that the, the public doesn't really understand, and kind of rightfully so. Uh, but where, where do you stand? So, uh, how do you think esports compare with other games, or what do you think the overall themes for games? What, what is your takeaway message from right. these? Um, I think with esports, toxicity has always been a thing in games. Uh, as Alexis from our esports panel yesterday uh, mentioned, we didn't invent trash talk. Uh, athletes have been doing that for <laughs> decades. Um, you know, we just kind of do it in a different way, I guess. Um, so, I think a lot of times people perceive. Um, that level of toxicity or banter as maybe condoning violence or condoning more aggression. Um, and so I think that that is, that is an issue in esports is this outward aggression. They are public figures. Um, you know, rage directed at an individual versus rage directed at the game. Um, in my opinion, those are very different things. Um, you know, as an, if against an individual, um, you know, I, I'm not super knowledgeable about um, aggression studies, just specifically aggression and you know the correlation or the causation of, of actually violent acts. But to me, if you're directing it at an environment, at kind of an inanimate thing that doesn't you know maybe have any effects, it's kind of one of those coping mechanisms where you go home and you have a bad day and you punch your pillow, like, and then you feel better, or you cry and you feel better. Um, so I think that this debate is an important one. Um, it's a hot topic, especially for parents. I think a lot of the issue also stems from um, parents maybe not being as knowledgeable about the games industry and the field. Um, you know, the ESRB puts out ratings for a reason. Uh, you know, a 10-year-old is not supposed to be playing Counter-Strike, uh, or I think Rainbow Six is also rated M, I'm not sure. But, but they put those out for that reason, is because they're very easily influenced. And to what degree they're influenced, the developmental psychologist can come in and step in. Um, but I... I don't know. I, I think that the studies that have been done have been mixed. I think there was a great panel, uh, I believe, yesterday yes. um, on violence in games, and uh, the individual went through all of the studies and said, "Here's why. Here's how it was designed. Uh, you know, here's maybe a potential issue with the methods or how they went about doing it or their uh, operationalization of yeah. aggression or violence." As I said earlier, it's so, a very complex social environment. Exactly, yeah. and so I think that that. It, what the APA is doing right now and going through all of the studies and, and being able to make a statement, I think as, as researchers and as 
people, we need to be skeptical and we need to question those methods and we need to say, okay, so you use this, why? Did you justify it? Um, where, what theory or what research is this based in? Um, right. So you can be confident in that. But I think to the public, I think we need to be um, better about how we're disseminating that information because people may only read one line and that may be the line they remember, but that's not your takeaway line. That's not the bottom line up front or whatever it is that you want them to remember. So it's very easy to misinterpret research, especially if you're not um, projecting it or uh, presenting it in a way that maybe is not um, able to be understood by a wide audience or misinterpreted. So I think that as a community, maybe we need to do a better job um, with research, being able to disseminate it more clearly with the message that they need to take away from whatever it is, an article or a paper. Right. Um, well, in addition to that, we're talking about a very complex issue. I mean, it's, but everybody wants a simple answer, right? right? Is there a connection between violence and video games? And they're looking for yes or no. It's a lot more complicated than that. And what we need, you know, we're talking about this as science. We, it needs to be tied back to empirical information that can lend support to which direction this answer comes from. And then being able to convey it in a meaningful way. Um, to, to the public is really important. There's also issues in terms of not only the, the content of the games and behaviors that occur, but it's very difficult as psychologists to measure it. I right. mean, there are certainly ethical issues of looking at this kind of topic because as researchers, we can't go into somebody's house and say, hey, play this video game and two hours later, we'll see if you, if you want to punch the dog. We, we can't do that <laughs> ethically, no. right? So we have to use these other measures that make it much more difficult right. to answer that question. Um, but it still needs to be grounded in, in that research. In science. Um, and the other thing that I find interesting too is that oftentimes a lot of these discussions revolve around a specific genre of games, namely first person shooters. And one of my arguments that I always make that I find interesting is that, for example, I play a wide variety of games. Right. Um, so, for example, I may play a fantasy game. So if I am learning how to be violent from that and the, the game is on dragons, does that mean tomorrow I'm going out there and being violent against dragons? They don't exist. So how do we map the kinds of activities and behaviors that come from games onto these outcomes that are seen? Right. It's an extraordinarily complex problem. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 and I'll just end it with the uh, caveat that, you know, research-wise, we have uh, some of the research we've seen uh, does uh, purport small increases in aggression, not a huge effect size, but we have not seen any research that actually uh, relates games to violence, to extreme violence. Right. Uh, and, and I and think that's correlational the studies typically, yes. right? Yeah. Causal. And to that point, I think you know it's easy to talk about the negative very easy to talk about the negative and ignore the positive. Right. Um, you know, there have been studies that I was, I've looked at where they actually have found an increase in pro-social behavior, um, such as interacting with individuals of different cultures, going out into the community and volunteering, um, civilian or civic activities, an increase, and obviously these are self-report, uh, you know, they're not going out stalking people, um, but self-reported increase in these types of pro-social behaviors or attitudes or feelings. And so that, you know, those are, those types of studies need to be continued, but they're also being kind of pushed down by this, you know, we're in a culture of, of violence and, and a lot of hate, you know, in, in the world. And so th that's very easily overshadowed. You know, right. it is an issue, you know, violence is definitely an issue, um, you know, maybe even more important than potentially, you know, pro-social behavior, increasing pro-social behaviors, but maybe there's a mitigating factor there. Maybe there's something we're missing that we can leverage in games that are promoting that, potentially preventing um, some of these things that happens. But okay. I think that's a perfect place to stop, so I'll ask one more question, <laughs> and this is a short answer essay, or yes, not even an essay. What's your favorite game? Oh, no. Oh, you're <laughs> killing me here. Can we just um, end it now? <laughs> this is going to be hard. Um, love Portal but mine's actually a tie. Um, Super Metroid and Castlevania Symphony of the Night because they're the same style of gameplay. Okay. Are we talking current or past? Your entire life. 
Uh, that's not possible. That's like asking a, a book reader. Okay, their current. Book. Um, I play a lot of Heroes of the Storm. I love that game. I also love the Persona series and the uh, Fire Emblem series. So, um, yeah, go out and, and buy them. No, I'm not sponsored by any of these companies, uh, but they're excellent games. So, and Persona is based in uh, psychology. Uh, those of you that know what a Persona is, I want to know yeah. about yourself. Go but for it, but go there are lots it. of great uh, games that are good uh, research uh, platforms. Absolutely. Kerbal yes. Space Force is often yes. overlooked, yes. Uh, but there's lots to be Space done in this area. So we uh, really encourage everybody who's listening to kind of go out, uh, learn more about these areas, not just in esports, but games yeah. uh, uh, overall, because there are some really fascinating research uh, areas across the spectrum of psychology sure. that you can really pursue. So thank you for listening, and uh, thank you for uh, your informative uh, discussions. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.